Dr. Anna Becerra is currently the program manager for schools and families at Just Community Central Coast in Santa Barbara, California. Anna's work in the field of education spans over 40 years. She began as an instructional assistant in a reservation school and later became a teacher there. Through the 80s and early 90s, she was a classroom teacher for the grades preschool through middle school, including bilingual programs. During the last decade of the 20th century, Anna directed equity projects at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Her administrative experience includes director of compensatory education programs and elementary school principal. She serves as facilitator and consultant for the National Equity Project in Oakland, California. And Anna's degrees include a bachelor's in elementary education from Montana State University, a Master's in Science Education from the University of Wyoming and a Doctorate in Educational Leadership and Organization from the University of California. Anna was born in San Bernardino, California, where her as were her parents. She has spent most of her life in Southern California, but she has also lived in Montana, Wyoming, Nevada, and Oregon. Anna's social activism began at an early age, along with her parents and younger siblings, as she marched for rights of migrant workers with Cesar Chavez on the final stretch of his trek to Sacramento from Delano, California in 1966. She has continued to be active for the rights, particularly educational rights, of people who have been marginalized. Dr. Anna Becerra's participation today on the plenary is co-sponsored by the Equity and Ethics Committee. Dr. Anna Becerra. Lynn, thank you for the introduction and for the invitation and to the Ethics and Equity Committee and Jerome Shaw for inviting me to be here under this hot light. Um, <laughs> 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 Sorry about that. But, but um, right now, thank you. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, in California, I don't know if other places are celebrating the Cesar Chavez Day and remembering everything and then mentioning in my, my brief bio uh, a very pivotal time in my life when I was Twelve years old. Uh, uh, my parents driving us out to the outskirts of Sacramento. My dad had lost his job, first of all, in Southern California. We moved up to the Sacramento area. What we would used to do for entertainment was go for a ride. So we went for a ride one day, and they took us out to the country just on the outskirts of Sacramento. And we parked our car, and I saw all these people marching up the road. And we got out. I was the oldest of six, and my, there was four of us then. My baby brother was on my dad's shoulders, and we got into the march. And my mom gave me a quick education as we were marching, saying, you know, folks are walking for days. Going to go talk to the governor. Going to tell him about the conditions. You know, going to try to get things right. You know, and just going on through all the different conditions she had grown, grown up as a, a, a party. Uh, as a farm worker in between school times. My grandmother really believed in education, so they only did in the summer and then went back to school all the time. And we were walking up to the Capitol, and I got to the Capitol to the grounds, and suddenly the whole mood, the mood of the march changed. And up there at the Capitol, my mother even got agitated and upset, and she said, the governor left town. It was uh, in the grounds, Jerry's dad. Um, and as a 12-year-old, I, I stood there looking around and noticing who is here and seeing the faces of all the people that are marching, realizing this is not who this government is about or cares about. And it really hit me. And that pretty much was a pivotal point in my life. Um, and that story, that time, has continued to build and teach me lessons. For example, uh, it's back in the late 90s, um, I was invited to do a talk at a new high school in Phoenix, Arizona, Cesar Chavez High School. And the principal got up, and an Anglo principal, talking about how the movement was really multi-racial. Uh, there were a lot of people there. I'm thinking, oh, no, it wasn't. I didn't see you there. And, but I didn't say anything about that. However, the lesson I learned was years later when I met uh, a, a man who was about 10 years older than me had been there too, so he was in his early 20s. And I mentioned that to him. And he said, oh yeah, white people were there. They were walking on the outskirts. And the brown people were in the middle. They were, and then I, I was, that's when I started learning more about the importance of allies. And that we're all really in this together. 
that uh, people in positions of privilege have a responsibility and also a benefit for working towards the rights of the target. And that applies to classrooms too. So um, in looking at this chapter here, uh, the chapter really uh, begins by talking about the notion of acting white and students feeling that burden of acting white and what that means. And sometimes that, that whole concept is really baffling the teachers because they hadn't thought about that. And it reminds me very much of Herbert Cole's writings about global not learning and, and making a very intelligent, intelligent decision that I, what do I have to give up in order to become what you think I should become, to learn your history, to learn about what you think is important. And then, then how do teachers negotiate that and how do students also navigate the system of maintaining their home culture, home languages, and yet benefiting and, and accepting what the school has to offer. And you spoke of the relevancy and the importance of relationships. So what do teachers need to do to keep it relevant? Um, so really, it is about teaching science because it's not about, it's not teaching science, it's not teaching math, it's teaching students. And you need to know the people. You need to build those relationships, the relevancy. And then, from that, we can build on the rigor because we truly then will know where the students are, where they're coming from, there's going to be that trust established, that groundwork has to be happening. I think um, in, in terms of looking at the last 20 years and what's changed and transpired, we went from a very progressive, I think, very in the early 90s, we were starting to move to a more progressive way of looking at teaching, we had constructivist instruction, uh, different philosophies about uh, cooperative learning, the more thematic units were going on in classrooms, and then through um, no child left behind and everything, it became very much about the test and, and just bits of knowledge, bits of facts to know and, and repeat. Now we're moving into the Common Core curriculum, so we're very much moving back more into a thematic, deeper inquiry, and I love questions. So I love this book. I think everything is about questions. I, for instance, a little child, I would get scolded for asking so many questions. The questions really are what's important because we continue to grow in question. When we think we have the answer, we need to question it and just stir it up again so we can come to a new understanding once again. When we think we have to figure out, ask more questions because there's always more to grow with. Um, another thought that came to me as I was reading this book was just this notion of when I was in my teacher education programs back in the 70s, when we were talking about students of color, it wasn't, the term wasn't students of color, it was culture, the culturally disadvantaged, the linguistically deprived. And then we progressed to calling them students at risk. Always the focus of the problem being on the student. And so we need to step back and look at the context within which the students are living. The, the way that the institutions of schools replicate what has happened in society. The biases of society, the separation of society, that's the issue to be looking at. All, all we really have been focusing on in the literature and some of our, our coursework is there on what's the problem with the child. Schools um, very much need to respect where the children are coming from. I, I'm reminded also of my mother's experience of going to school in very segregated schools. And one of the first things her teachers did was tell her her parents didn't know how to spell her name. So the teacher changed the spelling of her name. Her name is Estella. The teacher said, oh, your parents don't know how to spell your name. They put one L, it means two. And as she says it, that's just how things were. So I accepted it. And she changed the spelling of her name to two, to two else. Um, and then also what that, what that did uh, later on in my life was um, <clears throat> my name was, was um, given to me as Anna. But it also can be Anna. And the idea was my parents wanted me to go to school and not cause the teachers too much difficulty with my name. So they were looking ahead. They also didn't want me to know the home language. They didn't want me to speak Spanish first. My father would say, if you do that, you can have an accent if you 
people are going to think they're not smart. My dad has an accent. Um, so what that did was cut me off as the oldest of six, cut me off from the, the close communications with my great-grandparents who I had at the time, and my grandparents. And so it gets back to this notion of acting white. What was I having to give up? What was the divide that was being created before did I have this forward movement into a society that was very much not our, our culture, our language? And I don't think that needs to be. Teachers need to take the time to have those relationships. Not only does a relationship go one way of knowing the student, but be vulnerable to share some of your own experience, to build that trust. And then we can really know what is important to the child? What are the incidents in their life? How do we tie that in? Maybe it doesn't directly bring up a science lesson, but it brings up respect for the life lived. And then I, as a student, might be more receptive to the learning that you're trying to impart. And also, not to underestimate the amount of burden. The gift of the advanced courses do not belong just to the ones that do well on Eurocentric curriculum and test well on it. That, uh, that brings up just quickly, I know my time's about up, but another um, story in my life is when I was, am I out? Am I done? Okay, real quick. Uh, when I was teaching minor education summer school, I was also teaching a bilingual gifted course, or class, elementary level. The curriculum I was using during the week, I decided just to use the same curriculum with my migrant students, and they were thriving. So much so, I was telling Jerome when I got here, that I had been using a FOSS, with FOSS program. I was piloting the nutrition unit, and I did that with my migrant students. And those children just took off with it so much that years later, one of those students won the county science project. Fair science fair project, and his whole unit was based on nutrition. And he had continued with that thinking. I'm thinking, had we not, had I thought of writing it as for medium, just get him up to speed, teach him English, where would he have gone? Would he have ever been that prize winner at the county fair, in, or the county um, science 